Good morning, everyone. Welcome to an extended streaming week featuring an incredibly hype new release. That is right. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's the premiere of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the game we've all been waiting for. But in addition, we've got tons of stuff to talk about on today's podcast, including a bunch of game news that happened during my day off, and of course, my fabled fan favorite Phil's Day Off segment. All this and more on today's show. See you in a sec. Alrighty, everybody. Welcome, welcome to a new month, even though it's not. Technically, it should be. Technically, this morning should be March 1st, but we have a special thing that we like to call leap year, that every four years we have an extra day in February, and that's what today is, February 29th, 2024. However, I've jumped the gun with the new setup. As you can see, this will be our new background for the month of March. I don't think I've ever done this combination before, so there you go. Um... And I welcome you here to the show, and I welcome you to seven straight days of streaming. That is right. While last week I had a shorter week, this week, to make up for the launch of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and to have enough time to play it all day today, plus this week, I'm doing seven straight days. Holy moly. That's cool, right? Of course. Undoubtedly, as I expected, this morning as I begin the show, we have way less attendees. We only have 165 people sitting here on the podcast. And you might say, wait a minute. It's a hype new release. Why would only 165 people be sitting around there for the show? Because we're starting an hour early. <laughs> I announced this back on uh, Tuesday. I said, hey guys, FYI, because of some personal stuff going on, I have to do my stream an hour earlier on Thursday. So if you want to be there for the show, if you don't want to miss out on all the hot topics and everything we'll talk about on the Return Podcast as we do every week be there an hour earlier and only about a third of my audience listened <laughs> this is not surprising whenever change happens right it's it's really hard to get people to adjust to a change especially when you're someone like me who has a set schedule where every day like clockwork I'm usually here every single day so that people know what to depend on, right? I know that if I show up to Phil's stream at such and such a time, he'll be in the midst of gameplay or whatever, right? <clears throat> and so, I'm not shocked to see that we have a smaller audience. However, as you know, with the show, it lasts about an hour and a half. And so by the time that we're done with the podcast, likely we'll have people who are filing in for either the early gameplay or the podcast itself and be like, wait, the podcast is over. So hopefully we'll have a better, a better audience here uh, to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth together, okay? So, speaking of which, yes, as you can see, today is the launch day of a huge game, like pretty much the biggest release of the year so far, correct? I mean, I don't think there's been a single game that's come out in 2024 with as much hype behind it as Rebirth. Um, I got my border up for Final Fantasy. I got my... Cloud Strife wig ready to go. That's right. I'm not kidding you. Someone purchased me a supposed Cloud Strife cosplay wig for this event. This is how it came. This is actually it. Yeah. This. That's a Cloud Strife wig. It, it didn't come in any other box. It didn't come in another bag. It literally showed up on my doorstep just sitting there like this in this bag. Would you like to see it? Wow, it looks just like him. I mean, I don't think you could be any closer to the real Cloud Strife. <laughs> Uh, anyway, by the way, it came with this. I think this is a hairnet. I think if you have, like, messed up hair or, like, weird hair, you put on the hairnet. 
so it doesn't interfere with the wig or something like that. Uh, so you might say, what? Yeah, a fan was like, oh, would you like if I sent you a Cloud Strife wig to, to put on for, like, the premiere of Final Fantasy VII, would you like that? And I said, I don't see why not. I've worn other wigs. It might be something funny, right? And basically, this is what shows up, this thing. So if we do hit the hat gold today of tips, I'll put it on. Um, <laughs> actually, I think what we should do, since this is so ridiculous, I think we should actually have this be the bigger, the bigger goal today. I think we should do glasses, vest first, and then this is the highest level tier tip, I think. That's what I think anyway. I mean, you guys could disagree, but this looks so bad. I can't believe they actually made and sold this thing uh, as like a cosplayer's official wig. It looks terrible. Like, I mean, and I have a Ken Masters wig, you know, from my Ken outfit, and this just looks significantly worse in quality to me. <laughs> Dude, this looks like, like, like half of uh, like Rod Stewart's hair, or like um, David Bowie in Labyrinth. Right, that's what this reminds me of. It looks nothing whatsoever like Cloud Strike. You could tell that this is probably like twenty bucks, right? This is probably like a twenty dollar wig. This isn't any high end cosplay wig or anything like that, right? Um, anyway, so. Yeah, that's going to happen, I guess, if we do hit a support level later today. Uh, at first, I was kind of hyped for it until it actually showed up and I saw it. And I was like, it's nice of the person to say, hey, I want to do something nice for your premiere stream. At the same time, I mean, sadly, this is just a pure example of the kind of crap that you will get off of Amazon. It's, uh, it's hilarious because all the cosplay wigs on Amazon look amazing in the preview pictures. They look exactly like Cloud's hair. And that's what you get in the mail. It's like, what the fuck? Anyway, so that's in, in play today. So, um, let us talk about uh, today. Yes, I'm playing Final Fantasy VII all day today. All right, once this podcast ends, roughly around noonish, we're going to jump right in for about three hours of gameplay. Yes, this stream is ending an hour early. But then tonight, I'm coming back 6.45 p.m. Pacific time for about another two to two and a half hours of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So by the, by the time we're done with today, we'll have around five and a half hours of gameplay. From what I'm to understand, the game has an intro segment that lasts about three hours. So that's probably what we'll be doing on this very first stream. Um, and then tonight, we'll be jumping further in. Now, for the record, no... I did not play the demo on purpose. I knew that I was going to be playing this game this month. I knew that I was going to be super hyped for it. I didn't want to spoil by playing it a few weeks early, especially because I was making a big push to get as far as I could in the current playthroughs before this game came out. It wouldn't have made sense to play the demo when I'm already playing the game and I already am behind on everything else I'm trying to get through, right? So we were doing the demo, uh, or excuse me, we'll be doing the initial intro today i'm sure part of that is probably the demo but since i'm doing a double stream of the game likely we will get past that and into other gameplay as well by the end of today now final fantasy 7 rebirth will be the major stream several days this week including today tomorrow saturday monday and tuesday so if you do the math right that's five days plus the night stream tonight we should be more than 17 hours into final fantasy 7 rebirth by the time the week ends the only day i'm not playing it as the mainstream is sunday because sunday is my react day so we're doing my clip show on dsp reacts that day and then uh wednesday i want to keep in the rotation baldur's gate 3 that's been an absolutely crazy playthrough of over 100 i think it's 102 hours now we're up to something like that um and we're in the final area we're unlocking quests we're making progress and I don't want people who've been around for that ride for the last two and a half months to feel like I forgot them and put it on a total hiatus. So instead, we're definitely going to be doing it once a week, last day of the week moving forward, okay? So, that's a lot of this game this week. And I understand for some of you, there's a couple things. Number one, many of you probably don't want spoilers. So you probably won't be around, but understand something. Five hours today, three hours every other day, a lot of you will be ahead of me. 
So you don't have to really worry that much about, oh no, I'm going to have horrible spoilers, past maybe today, right? Like, probably for those of you who are playing this as their major game, uh, I think that you'll be like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not like I'm playing this nonstop all weekend and I'll be 40 hours in by next week. You know, I'm probably playing it way less than people who are actually bought the game and playing it themselves. That's a good thing, right? There you go. Number two, I don't want this game to be the only game I'm playing, all right? If I did that, sadly what would happen is you have people who'd be upset. We got other games for variety. I'm a variety streamer. So we're still going to do Street Fighter. Friday, excuse me. We're still going to do Tekken for Friday Night Fights tomorrow night. I got a big Freudian slip there because Street Fighter had an expansion yesterday, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Because they actually rebalanced the game a little bit. And that's going to be part of game news today, the, the Street Fighter 6 rebalance patch. I'll talk a little bit about it for those who followed along my gameplay for seven months. Um, but I'm not doing the Street Fighter stuff. I want to stick with Tekken for now. So... Check it on the late stream tonight, uh, on uh, Friday night. And Saturday night, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. Sunday night, we're doing DSP throwbacks, uh, retro react of more Heavy Rain. Monday night, more uh, Tekken. And then Tuesday, wait. No, Monday night, no stream because I'm doing private stuff. Tuesday night, Tekken. Wednesday night, Infinite Wealth. And that's the streaming week. So, seven straight days. F uh, five of those days, <laughs> Final Fantasy VII is the main stream. All right, good variety this week for sure. Okay, um, and yes, because some people are bringing this up, they're saying, "So is your internet back?" No, I'm broadcasting in through a magical means today. I've actually completely foregone technology. I made a deal with Beelzebub in the backyard. I opened a portal to hell, and I say, "Hey, if you let me stream today, you can have some uh, special privileges." <laughs> and he agreed. No, my internet's back. Yeah, last night the internet went out. Right as I went to sleep, like I was going to sleep, it was around like 12.30 a.m., you know, right, I usually go to sleep around 1 a.m., and uh, I'm getting ready, my wife and I, and what we do is we like to play music at the end of the night, um, nice relaxing music to get us, you know, in the mood to go to sleep, and we go to play it, and everything goes off, we're like, what the hell, and I'm like, don't tell me, right, I mean, after all the problems I had on my internet last year, yes, it is true, there was an actual troll of mine who worked for Comcast, my internet company, and they were purposefully messing with my internet, going into my my modem and changing my settings, putting in malicious messages, and hitting reset during my streams. That's why I was kicked off the internet during the side scrollers interview last year, if you can believe it. Anyway, um, with all that being said, I was nervous about other malicious issues, but I was like, wait a minute, it's 12.30 in the morning, right? Why would this be happening now? You know, and then I went and checked both of my modems reset and neither of them was reconnecting to the internet and I was like it's definitely not a troll it's something going on with Comcast where they've lost service for tonight and so we just went to sleep and lo and behold came up this morning and it, everything's fine so no problems there don't worry about that okay all right excuse me so full speed ahead today what a podcast we've got because I want to talk about my day off but I also want to talk about news there was a incredibly tremendous amount of gaming use yesterday now you might say wait a minute why is this weird phil because you there's always a tremendous amount of gaming news during your day off so this isn't there's no problem with that right except get this it happened on a wednesday when i'm usually here why is it that whatever day i take off of the week is the day that inevitably will have the most game news in it i'm lost it happens every single week I just, it's usually Thursday, so I decide to take a different day off. Oh, now it's Wednesday, and we'll have all this insane amount of news. <clears throat> okay, whatever. So we'll talk about it today. Quite a lot of topics to talk about. Um, most not good. Some really mass, messed up, nasty stuff happening in the game industry. Um, and it's sad to see it happening because I hate to say it, it doesn't look like it's the direct result of anything besides mismanagement and greed. But we'll talk about that as we get to the, the uh, segment. Um, what I think what we should do, <clears throat> quickly, let's recap what we did on Tuesday. Let's talk about my day off, right? We already talked about the schedule, so let's instead then jump right into game news after that, and then we'll get set up for Final Fantasy. Fair enough. Now, I will say this, all right, before we get started. Today is February 29th. There usually isn't a 29th day in February, all right? It is the last day of the month. Any support that you guys lend me today 
is incredibly helpful because I'm trying, obviously, to come back from the fact that I had no exaggeration. I wish this was an exaggeration. Over 2,500 fake gifted memberships on this channel for a month and a half, all right? Pretty much all my legitimate memberships went away. And that's awful because I'm not getting paid for any of those. These are people who normally would have supported my content, supported my channel with a membership. They liked the fact that they were getting all these features. And then what happened is everyone got it for free. And because of that, of course, who's going to pay for something they got for free, right? It's like, oh, it's a freebie. And as much as nice as that might be, and you might say, well, that's great. You got new emotes on your channel. Everyone got access to the features. I lost a big chunk of my income, all right? This is not a joke. This is not a gross exaggeration. I lost, arguably, anywhere between $1,500 to $2,000 over the course of a month and a half that these memberships were fake, okay? Now... There's no way to fix the problem. It's going to be ongoing. But I think undoubtedly what's going to happen is it's not going to be as big of a deal in the long term. It was just an initial shock. But it sucks because not only did this happen at a time when there's lowest ad revenue on YouTube, meaning already I was going to take a hit of my income because there's not a lot of ads to go around on YouTube in the months of January and February. But also, on top of all of that, there was a lull in games. If you take a look, pretty much I played exactly the same games for the entirety of the month of February. Like a Dragon Infinite Well, Tekken 8, Baldur's Gate 3. Now, I tried to do some different stuff there with the Retro React streams, which went really well, right? But overall, there's not much I can do. I got to play what's out. Suicide Squad was a humongous flop. Huge flop. No one cares about the game. It's a terrible game. It, it's dead, so no one... I, I didn't play it. That was a game that I thought would have been good. Didn't work. Um, Pal World. After initial interest... I stopped playing it, by the way, so did everybody else. If your guys aren't aware, they went from over 2 million players down to less than 100,000. The, the, the player base has completely fallen off for the game. It was a hype game for a couple weeks, and just like all these memeable games, it died and no one talks about it anymore. Although Helldivers 2 has seen great success, it's an online co-op shooter. I don't play co-op games like that, so it doesn't fit into my forte of the games that I play. So if you look at it this month, it was undoubtedly going to be a deader month. And there was nothing I could really do about it. I even played the, the, the very, very small Silent Hill game, right? It's only three hours long. I got through it in one sitting. So all that being said, I did my best to try to entertain you guys. Thank you to those who were around and did support. But yeah, what happened was I have a giant hit now of income because people who would have had memberships did not get them. They just got them for free, and I hate to say it, although there was a handful of people who were like, oh, listen, I was going to buy a membership, but I got one for free. So now I'm going to come by, and I'm going to support you in another way. I'm going to send you a tip. I'm going to do a super chat. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was like 2% of the people who normally are members. No exaggeration, because typically on this channel, I'll have anywhere between 500 to 800 members a month, which equates, no exaggeration, to around 1500 to $2,000 of my consistent income, and I don't have that now. So now what's going to happen is when I get paid in March, I'm pretty screwed. Like this month, I feel I'm going to have to penny pinch and cut giant corners. And of course, this comes at a time when I have to buy a bunch of games. I just bought Final Fantasy VII. I gotta, I'm going to be getting the Battlefront Collection. I'm going to be getting Rise of the Ronin. I'm going to be getting Dragon's Dogma 2. And there may even be others this month. So in a month when I actually have a big cost coming up is a month when I'm going to get paid the least. So today, if you're here to chill with me and hang out with the premiere of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth because I'm very excited for this game. As I told you guys, this is one of my biggest, most hyped games of the year by far. Now I'm I'm so much more on board with it this time, okay? And here's why, all right? Um, the way I see it is the first game, Final Fantasy VII Remake, okay? Sadly, was a game that was mismarketed. Even though it did well, it really made it feel like it was what it wasn't. If they had said, this is Final Fantasy VII Reimagined. It's not the original game. We're going in a different direction, a multiverse where anything can happen, so come check it out because it's your favorite characters with a new twist. I think everyone would have been like, what the hell, that sounds amazing. Instead, they literally said, oh, it's just Final Fantasy VII, but we're remaking it for a modern audience. That's not what it was at all. It was a lie. If you play the game, there's tons of differences of that game between that and the original. And the ending is completely different and now changes the entire plot 
of the Final Fantasy franchise. So because of that, it's new. This game is called Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, The Unknown Journey Continues. The title art on the PlayStation 5 has Zack Fair standing there along with Cloud, Strife, and Sephiroth. He's alive. So it's going everywhere, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's going in a totally different direction. That makes me excited. Why? Because it's not a prequel. It's not a rehash or redo. It's a new game. I'm down for that. If you're going to make a brand new Final Fantasy game, I'm on board. I don't like the modern remake, the modern you know, rehash or a prequel style event. I want something that anything can happen and you don't know. Right now, the big question for everyone, what's going to happen to Aerith? Is Aerith gonna? Is it Aerith or Eris? Because I was getting confused because they had. I don't even remember what they call her in this. But um, will she survive? You know, historically, she was one of the most shocking character deaths in video game history in the 1990s because she does pass away during the course of Final Fantasy VII. Not even at the end. She. It's like the middle of the game. Okay. So it's Aerith. T H. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what will happen? Will she survive? Will they have someone else die instead? That's an interesting take, right? Now that Zach Fair is alive, how will he change the plot? Will you get to play as him? Will he be a character? Will he play differently from Cloud? These are interesting questions that we need answers, right? And I stayed away from spoilers, and don't worry, I'm sure we're going to get them. Just to forewarn everyone, I almost guarantee you we're going to be spoiled on this game. The game's now out, everyone's playing it. Within a day, the entire plot will be on the internet and people will be going around spoiling it for everybody. And there's nothing much that you can basically do, um, right? So I guess we'll see, all right? Um, but I'm excited. Now knowing that this is a new game, this gets me excited. By the way, I'm happy that this came out now and here's why. Man, Final Fantasy 16 was a huge disappointment last year, right? And that's supposed to be the flagship numbered title installment you know what i'm saying and basically you're like man what happened how was it so bad it was the pacing was terrible the gameplay was piss easy like a play school final fantasy button mashing in the combat the game sucked i was so disappointed at how bad it was i'm happy to get back to this because re remake was good remake was very good and now we get to play this on ps5 at launch which means the graphics are probably going to be absolutely outstanding and jaw-dropping Plus, the other cool thing about this, it's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth open world. Unlike the first game where you were stuck in Midgar. In this one, it's the open world gameplay that you loved from the original Final Fantasy VII. This is when the game got much better. So I'm very excited to have this happen, and I hope that the game is as good as, as people are saying. I'm very, very pumped, and that's why I'm so excited to even play this so much this week and carry this as the mainstream for the next three plus weeks i want to have a great time with all of you enjoying a brand new release groundbreaking graphics great gameplay a redone plot new elements i'm ex i'm just really pumped i really am and i hope that it's good and i hope that you guys are going to come by every day and hang out with me listen the reason that the Baldur's gate 3 playthrough works so well is because of engagement because every day people are coming by and engaging if we can get that engagement for this game too that would make me so happy and this really is the first giant release of the year. Yeah, Tekken 8 and Like a Dragon were new games, but I didn't feel that level of hype that I'm feeling for Final Fantasy VII, okay? So, I hope you guys are, are on board, all right? I'm pumped for this. Um, So, yeah, that's why I'm playing it so much this week, but I do have to maintain balance and everything. Uh, I'm super pumped. Anyway, um, so, let's talk. Let's now talk about what happened on Tuesday, and then let's talk about... My day off, and then we'll get into game news. So Tuesday, Baldur's Gate 3, more major progress. It was a major stream where we were already in Baldur's Gate. We went into the sewers. We found a whole bunch of combat down there. We unlocked a bunch of basically side quests for our exploration. Uh, one of our party members was kidnapped, Lazel, and now we have to try to, to rescue her, but we can't really do it yet because it's part of the main plot. So then we had to go back to the surface. We started getting involved in a whole bunch of other quest lines like this... this race of female knights but they're like nautical people who dress in scales it's i don't even know what the hell they're called it's really weird so we got that quest going then we found a bunch of oil in the water dead fish and we're investigating that so there's all this stuff going on um in the game as always and i'm very excited uh to play more of it later this week but it definitely has to be the playthrough that's on a uh, 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 kind of a backseat to final fantasy 7 uh, more Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth Tuesday night. It went really well. The stream was super fun. We, we advanced a bunch of side quest lines plus main story. 
Uh, and that's where we're headed with that game is that we're going to continue with mostly story progress and not really do a ton of side content right now um, when it comes to, like, uh, you know, grinding stuff or anything like that. No Sujimon or anything like that. Uh, so that's going to be fun to jump into two more times later this week when we get to it, all right? So overall, Tuesday was a great streaming day. FYI, we got a poll going right now for what you want to see as the Retro React stream this coming Sunday night on DSP Throwback. It's going to be heavy rain at this point. I don't even think there's really a reason for me to pretend like it's not going to be heavy rain because when you take a look at all of this here, all right, and you refresh, it's basically heavy rain is at 56% and everything else is at like 15 I was just thrown for a loop because I heard the trash uh, the trash truck coming by outside. And I'm like, why is the trash truck here? It's not garbage week. And no one has their cans out. But I don't think it is. I think it's compostables. I think that's what it is. They're getting the compostables from the end of, of the, the street or something. That did throw me for a loop because here they only collect trash every two weeks. And you only get one can. So basically if you don't have your trash thrown out you're screwed you have to go to the dump and pay to throw out your trash it's pretty stupid how they do it here anyway um so let's get into it let's talk about my day off yesterday which was an odd day off because it wasn't my normal day off usually it's thursday and this week it was wednesday uh we did a lot it was actually quite a busy day so i went out and i ran air and by the way i hurt my back and it must have been i wrenched my back in my sleep or something because I didn't lift anything heavy. I didn't do anything strenuous. But as I was going to sleep on Tuesday night, I had big shooting pain in the left side. Usually I have it in the right. It was the left side of my shoulder blade all the way down my back. I was like, what is this? This really sucks. Uh, and so I, I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning yesterday and I was like, oh my God, I'm in like excruciating pain. My back was killing me. So I must have wrenched it or something in my sleep. And it sucked because... I had planned to actually uh, make a trip to the dump. We have some stuff really accumulated in our garage, odds and ends from around the house and stuff. We were going to throw a bunch of stuff out, and I couldn't go. I'm like, there's no way I can go today because my back is killing me. This would be bad if I hurt my back even worse, you know, going to the dump. So we didn't do that. Um, instead, I just kind of did grocery shopping and stuff like that. Uh, basic stuff. Outside of that, things that we did together and outside of the normal realm, uh, my wife was like, you know... It's been a while, and uh, our carpet in the bedroom is pretty gross because every once in a while, I told you about this, that earlier in this week, uh, Jasper Kitty had woken us up vomiting all over the floor in the middle of the night. It happens sometimes with a cat. Sometimes cats just barf for whatever reason. Their stomach gets upset. They eat something. They found on the floor. They're you know, a piece of fuzz or something they're not supposed to eat. It upsets them, and that's it. So our rugs in this house are white. Of course, we never would have picked those, but that's just what was in the house when I bought it. Um, so when Jasper goes bleh onto the floor, it makes a stain. Now we clean it, but it doesn't permanently really go away. It's like always slightly off. So my wife says, why don't we do a full carpet shampooing in the bedroom? And I said, that sounds like a good idea. It really needs it. So we do it. So much dirt came out of the carpet. All right. And we've, we've done it. We usually try to do it at least once a year if we can. Uh, I think we did it about a year ago. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just completely off in my head. The water in the actual carpet shampooer was black, okay? And we emptied it out in the bathtub because you're not going to put it anywhere else. The bathtub clogged because there was so much dirt and dust and hair in this water, okay? I had to get, like, liquid plumber and pour it down. I had gloves on. I'm, like, trying to unclog the toilet or the uh, the drain in the tub. It was all disgusting. Um, and basically what happens is when you do this, big clumps of this dirt and hair come up and and leave like they sit on top of your carpet so i was going walking around with slippers on on this soaking wet carpet picking up these clumps of really gross yuck and throwing them out with paper towels <laughs> um but a funny thing happened so we've always had this long storage ottoman all right at the end of our bed 
when I first moved in here a decade ago, the ottoman was it kind of matches our living room couch downstairs, which is a sectional. It's the same material. It looks the same. It was meant to come as almost like a set. And so when I moved in here, I always put that ottoman, I put it at the bottom of the bed, the foot of the bed. The problem was I didn't really measure and having that ottoman there, there's just not a lot of room to walk between the ottoman and then with the dresser that we have against the other wall in the back of the, the bedroom. So it's kind of narrow in there. But I just always left it there. And the funny part is I remember distinctly when I first got the ottoman, I was like, oh, this is going to be perfect. I'll be sitting on this all the time, getting dressed in the morning, and I'll use it for storage. But because of the positioning of the ottoman, you basically never use it. It just sits there for, sh for looks, but you never really use it for anything because there's not a lot of room. So my wife... And I moved the ottoman into the hallway to do the va the uh, shampooing of the carpet. And we realized something. We're like, this is really nice in the hallway. Like, this, it's it's a perfect thing you put against the wall. It, the hallway is wide enough that it doesn't make the hallway super narrow. You sit on it like, oh, this is nice and comfy out here. It's actually a nice little resting spot right in the middle of the hallway where you can relax. And we opened it up. We're like, we don't really have anything significant in this thing. We can start using this for storage. And I'm like, and then we go in the bedroom. Now the bedroom is just way more open because it doesn't have a giant storage ottoman blocking the walkway through the bedroom. It feels way more open space. Or like, why didn't we do this earlier? Because, you know, you don't think of it. It's just, oh, it's just always been there, right? It's been there for a decade. You don't think to move it. And you move it like, oh, my God, like, this is way better. So <laughs> we had a little bit of, uh, you know, moving stuff around. Like, this is pretty neat. So we did that. Um, you know, we did a lot of housework yesterday. We did a lot of cleaning of the house, different various things in the house, uh, vacuuming, scrubbing, yada, yada, yada. Nothing too exciting for you guys to hear. But the funny part is, so my wife is looking for a game to play right now. Okay, now she only has the Xbox Series S. She doesn't have a PS5. So she's like, maybe she would have played Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, but she doesn't have a PS5. So that's not, you know, in the cards. Um... You know, what she's going to play? And she's been looking for other games. Last week, she tried Tales of... Tales of... What the fuck was the la latest Tales of game? I can't even remember the name of it. She tried it. She wasn't really impressed after the first session. She's like, nah, I'm probably not going to go back to it. Kind of boring. And, and she didn't like the fact that in that game, they don't tell you the... Uh... Oh, it's Tales of Arise? Okay. They don't tell you, like, how difficult enemy parties are. Like, for example, when you're playing Like a Dragon Infinite Well... Every enemy party has an indicator above its head. Is it blue, red, pink? How hard is it? And it even tells you if it's a mini boss, so you know ahead of time. In that game, they don't tell you shit. So you could run into an enemy that's way higher level than you and just it instantly trounces you. It's like, wow, great, now I lose progress. <laughs> right? Or I have to restart. It's just, it's just I, I agree, like, that game, it's fine, but it definitely, it, it adheres to a lot of old tropes of JRPGs that modern convenience has surpassed these and the game doesn't have them. Like, it ignores the fact that we have progress in JRPGs now. So, anyway. Um, basically, she didn't like it that much. So, she's not going to play that. She's looking for different games. So, she went onto Game Pass and downloaded a bunch. She downloaded um, uh, a Forza Horizon game. I don't remember if it was... I think it was four, 5, because 4 and 5 are both on there. She's never played one before, but she wants to see if maybe she likes the open-world exploration and the graphics. Uh, she actually downloaded Monster Hunter Arise. And I told her, I said, listen, Monster Hunter is a fine franchise, but just to forewarn you, Monster Hunter also has this really installed, like, learning curve. If you don't, if you haven't played a previous Monster Hunter game before, you're going to need a guide to explain all these different crafting systems, and the game can be played 700 different ways depending on the weapons you use, and really it's meant to be a co-op game, not a solo game, it's not as fun solo, but she downloaded it, you don't know if she's going to check it out, um, but get this, the first game, because she downloaded like three games at once, the first game that downloaded, Power Wash Simulator. Now I actually tried Power Wash Simulator on Game Pass over a year ago, I only just did the first stage. And I thought it was fun. I was like, this game is the most simple game you've ever seen, but it's relaxing and it's stimulating. And for someone like me, this is the kind of game that I could probably do this and then inter interact with my audience. We could have power wash nights where we talk and hang out and it would be like a chill stream of me doing that, right? So people didn't really ask for it. Like after that, I presented, I said, I would love to do this. What do you guys think? And everyone was like, no. So I never did it. We never implemented it, okay? But she starts playing it and she's like, Wow, like seriously, this is the most relaxing game ever, right? So 
basically what happened was she turned it on and we just kept, we just were she was playing it we were talking and hanging out and having a good time relaxing and having conversation and stuff while she played the game that's really what the game is it's something you do to relax to like occupy you and relax you while you're just kind of doing something else and it was really good like no exaggeration she i think she beat the first two stages and started the third or got really far in the third i don't know but you know a few hours where we we're just hanging out and she's doing power wash simulator and it actually ended up being very relaxing which is good because it took my mind off that my back was killing me last night or uh yeah yesterday so anyway um that was basically our day oh and for oh yeah i should tell you about this so for for dinner now we ne almost never do this okay we decided that we wanted burgers for dinner now we almost never do that like i said when we're going to order out on our day off we'll usually order from like a high-end restaurant something that's like a regional cuisine like recently we've been ordering uh korean food thai food indian food that kind of stuff well, all of a sudden we're craving burgers okay and basically we were like well we want to get it from a better place okay so we ended up ordering and i'm just gonna be honest you know i don't i don't want to pan a business but we're pretty disappointed because the business fucked it up so bad right like so we ordered from this place called the habit burger okay this is a place out here that they have char burgers meaning it's actual flame broiled burgers instead of fried they do it fresh for you they custom make it you can put whatever toppings you want on your burger and they do things like chicken sandwiches as well they do salads they do uh milkshakes they do fries they do onion rings they do all this stuff okay and so we ordered each of us i i ordered a char burger combo with onion rings and she ordered a chicken sandwich grilled chicken sandwich which was supposed to be a charred chicken like it has char on it from their grill with fries and it shows up all right it shows up fast by the way I'm like oh this is a good sign completely forgot the fries no fries in the order whatsoever oh great that's just fair right you forgot one of my items okay so you like you think that would be they fucked up one thing maybe they were busy my onion rings were so overcooked you could take the onion ring and you could beat it on the table and it didn't break. It was that hard. It was like they over overcooked it. Like they cooked them and then they cooked them again and then they cooked them again. That's how bad the onion rings were that showed up. And it's just, <laughs> just not, not even edible. Like what the fuck? I did try. They gave us ranch dipping sauce. I tried to dip it and eat. It. I was like, oh my god. Like what the fuck? So, her chicken sandwich was okay. But they don't season the chicken. All they do is they put cook it on the grill so it has a char flavor. But that's it. So she got one with like teriyaki sauce and, and like a bunch of condiments and cheese or, and stuff like that. It was all right, but it was very messy. My burger was pretty good. So we shared basically. We kind of went half seas on each. But how do you forget the side of one combo and then completely destroy the side of the other combo, right? So, you know, we had to complain and we got like a partial refund and then we were still hungry. So we ended up like having snacks later on at the night because, I mean, we didn't really get our full meals. We only got a sandwich instead of a full combo because they basically ripped us off. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, it wasn't a very good dinner. And the thing is, like the burger was good. Like the burger was dead on exactly how I want a burger. It was fresh. It was juicy. Everything on it that I wanted that I had ordered full of flavor so the burger was great the chicken sandwich was meh and this the one side we received was atrociously bad so how do you rate that <laughs> right i mean basically what that tells you is they're really good at burgers and literally nothing else like they probably have a, a staff where they have one person who always does the burgers and does a great job and then everything else is just a rush job by a bunch of kids who don't know what the hell they're doing and it ends up like shit So it is what it is. That was our amazing dinner. It wasn't very good. Um, so that was really our day off. All right. Oh, by the way, I totally forgot to use it. Son of a bitch. Well, it's too late now. Anyway. Uh, so that was our Phil's day off. Nothing, nothing overly special or anything like that. Um... 
Okay. Anyway, I guess we're going to get to the news segment. All right. By the way, I got distracted earlier. The point I was trying to make before I got completely on a tangent was that if you guys can support my streams today, it would really, really help a ton because I'm hoping that I can uh, basically get a situation where we can have a little bit of a rallying today for the new release. It'll help to make up for all the lost revenue of the fake memberships. I don't know if that's going to happen. I know people have been waiting for a new game. And finally, the new game is out, right? So I'm hoping that if you guys like today's content, if you like the fact I'm covering Final Fantasy so much today, please support the stream, okay? I would really, really appreciate that. If we could have a really great uh, day. Uh, oh, really? Robbie says, online orders and drive through orders are made separately in the back of these stores. I worked at Chipotle. Lots of restaurants do this. If you want quality, you have to go inside. The, the other orders are rushed. Jeez. Well, that's sad to hear. Here's a ghost kitchen situation, but no, because they really exist. That sucks. Anyway, yeah, guys, please support the streams today if you can. Today, particularly, things like Super Chats and memberships would be very, very helpful because anything you do today will still count for this month, and I'll get paid for it in March as opposed to if you show up tomorrow and support via Super Chats or memberships, I don't get paid till April. And March is going to be the month where I need help because... I'm already going to have way less income, plus I have to buy a bunch of games, so it would really help right now. So please, today, guys, support the streams if you can, if you like the, if you like the stuff, all right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to get into gaming news, and today we've got a million, a million topics. Like, it's so ridiculous how much happened during my day off. I, I just can't put up with it at this point, all right? First of all, a ransomware gang is claiming they have hacked Epic Games. They're saying they have 200 gigabytes of internal data, including emails, passwords, full names, possibly addresses, payment information, source code, and more from the company. And they are trying to hold them hostage. I mean, this is very reminiscent. Remember uh, that a similar thing happened with, uh, was it Rockstar? Who was it that it happened to? Now, I can't even remember. I think it was Rockstar, right? Or is it somebody else? I can't even remember at this point. Because this seems to be something that happens like five times a year now. Right? And it's funny because we were just saying recently... Oh, it was Insomniac. That's right. It was Insomniac after Spider-Man came out. Right? And it's just so weird because how on earth are all these companies being infiltrated like this? It seems like a prominent issue now in the modern day. But it wasn't recently like just a few years ago this wasn't happening now all of a sudden this is happening like constantly right and especially with epic games you got to understand why why this is such a big problem i mean fortnite probably the biggest microtransaction game besides maybe gta online so they probably have no exaggeration millions of customers pieces of information just from microtransactions of that game most kids play Fortnite in some capacity and have spent money in it. So at the very least, their parents' information is present on these Epic Game servers, and these hackers are claiming they have it. So what happens now? <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, this could be a huge problem for them. You know, if any of this information gets out, if they get hit with a class action, right? They're fucked. So I'm curious what will happen with this, and if they're going to give into demands or if they're just going to say fuck this we won't play ball with you know basically terrorists which is what they are and uh, and go from there but uh why is this happening so prominently rockstar with the leaks insomniac and now epic games because insomniac was the leak of wolverine remember the wolverine game and had the playable demo and everything so what's going on here i just I'm at a loss. Like, what is going on with security, right? You would think that a major company like this would have some, you know, some good security. In effect, how are these hackers getting into these companies' files? I would love, I would be fascinated to hear how they're doing it. Are they using the same tactic over and over? Is this a brand new tactic and no one's foreseen that it's happened and th that way no one has a way to combat it? Like, what is going on that this is just a recurring thing that seems to be just common now, right? I just don't know. Fed Rogers says a lot, a lot of people are saying it's because a lot of people are working now from home. I mean, I guess I can see that. But if you're going to work from home, well, again, why is there no security? Like, even if you're remote working, I mean, you got to log in. No. I mean, really, what is what is going on 
I really am I'm interested to know what's happening here with the situation. I mean, is it a work-from-home situation and they're exploiting this? I don't know. Um, all right, let's continue on because we have a lot of news to talk about today. Um, Rockstar Games has put out a company-wide message stating the following. All employees must return to the office five days a week starting in the month of April. Why? Well, as you know, since COVID, a lot of these companies have worked remotely. But what Rockstar is saying is that basically due to the fact that they have had so many issues with Grand Theft Auto 6 up to this point and keeping security, I mean, this goes hand in hand with the story we just had about Epic, they want to make sure that the game is locked down because they are now heading into the final development stages of GTA 6. So for security and productivity reasons, they are forcing employees to work physically at work instead of remotely. And apparently employees are not happy. They're pretty upset because I guess a lot of them are working under the impression or premise that they were going to al be allowed to do this remote work. And I guess I can understand if you're not in an immediate situation where basically you can do that, like get to work easily. I mean, I can understand how this is going to throw your life on its head. Um, so I guess the real question, because someone in chat just said, well, how is this legal? It depends on the employee's contracts. It's exactly what it depends on. So if you are a contracted employee, a salaried employee, in your contract, there's going to be terms that outline what is expected from you as an employee of the company. And they, they have to give you certain things and you have to do certain things for them. That's the two sides of the contract that they give you. However, in the United States of America, we have what's called at-will employment. And this is a problem because at-will employment, it was originally designed, all right, to give power to the employees because what used to happen was you would get into a contract with an employer, but then an employee would want to leave, but the contract would state that they can't leave for a set amount of time with this and this and this. And because of that, the employee would be stuck in a life situation where they have to keep working for a company they don't want to work for. Almost like not a slave because they had to get paid, but still imagine if a company says, well, we don't want, we know that you're a talented employee and we don't want you working for another competing company. So we're not going to allow you to leave our company. You're stuck with us for a long time, right? That's what they would do. So at-will employment is supposed to be a law that fixes that. And what the at-will employment says is basically thus. A company can fire you at any time for any given reason except one deemed illegal, such as racism, sexism, and stuff like that. But as long as it's a reason that's a, a, a qualified reason for termination, they could terminate you at any time. As an employee, you have the ability to work for a company and leave whenever you want. You don't have to work a set amount of time. There's no such thing as a two weeks notice. It is a myth. It is a professional courtesy that we do here in the United States that if you're gonna quit a job, you give your job two weeks notice, you're leaving. So they have two weeks to try to figure out what they're gonna to do to replace you or maybe shuffle your job responsibilities around. But the truth is, there is absolutely no legal repercussions for not doing that. You could just quit and walk out the fucking door and there's nothing anyone can do about it if you are an at-will employee, okay? So the intention is full flexibility. The problem is, since this law is so loose, Rockstar can literally say, well, we've now decided you have to come back to the office. And if someone refuses, Rockstar could just find an excuse and fire the person. And there's nothing that anyone can do about it. Now, of course, that person can sue Rockstar, but they'd have to prove in a court of law that Rockstar somehow violated some kind of a law or agreement or something like that. I'll give you an example. I worked for Best Buy for about one year. They hired me on a business team, so they paid me more than almost everyone else in the store because I was supposed to be selling servers and high-end equipment. This was the mid-2000s, by the way, so almost 20 years ago this happened. Then the company decided six months into the program they didn't want to do it anymore. So they were trying to force everyone in the business team to either get like high-end certifications or to downgrade your position to a lower paid position in the store because they didn't want to have the business team anymore. So you either were going to be like an installer for Best Buy at a high end or you were going to be like a line level employee and get paid half. I refused. I said, I'm not doing either. 
you hired me under this premise, therefore I'm going to stay in this job at this level no matter what, and there's nothing you can do about it unless you fire me, in which case I'm going to sue you. So what they did is they framed me. They actually said that I had violated the store's discount policy for buying three PlayStation 2 consoles at a 40 cent discount each. Guess what? They fired me for it. I went to court. I won easily. The judge laughed at them in my hearing. <laughs> Audibly laughed. And said to Best Buy, did you really think that someone would actually willingly risk their employment for $1.20? Are you stupid? <laughs> anyway, um, the point I'm making here is any company in the United States will find a reason to try to get rid of you if they want to get rid of you. So right now with Rockstar demanding all employees must come back to the office for the final leg of GTA 6, what if a third of the employees said, well, no, we don't want to do that. They'd be like, okay, bye. We'll find a reason. We'll just fire you. It doesn't matter, you know, what the reason is. They'll just figure out a reason. You know what I mean? That's how companies are. They see you as an asset in their portfolio. They see you as a number on a spreadsheet, a wheel, a cog in a giant machine. They don't see you as a person. So a company like Rockstar could easily say, listen, the whole industry is cutting back. And if you're not going to listen to us when we tell you to come to the office, we're just going to let you go and we'll find someone else who will do it. And they probably will. So the employees are upset because they were under the impression and were basically promised that they could all work from home. And now that promise is being basically turned back on. And of course, the other leg of this is if they're already being forced to come back to the office to finish GTA 6 and the premise is, oh, privacy and security, we can't have anything leak. What's to stop Rockstar from saying, well, you're already here, so you can't go back home ever again. You know, you're always working here from now on. No remote work ever again. They could do that. And the employees really have no power to stop it, right? So there you go. Um, anyway, so I guess we'll see what happens with this final push development, all right, of GTA 6 and what kind of, you know, news we'll get out of that. Uh, next story, Remedy Entertainment, the makers of Alan Wake 2 recently, the makers of Control, the makers of Quantum Break, and many other games over the years, have officially acquired the full intellectual property rights for the Control franchise from 505 Games. Previously, I guess it was like shared, but I guess Remedy now, with the hit that was Alan Wake 2, and the fact that they now want to make bigger games, better games, and they want to have that shared universe between Control and Alan Wake... They wanted to make sure that they fully owned the rights so they could do whatever they want with the franchise, and they have obtained it, right? So, pretty cool, right? Pretty darn cool. And uh, I certainly hope that they do a good job with it because Control was good, but not as good as I wanted it to be. The plot was amazing. The gameplay was meh, repetitive, and not that fun. If they can refine the gameplay to make it better then Control will be great. And I'm, I'm actually excited for a sequel to Control because it will tie in with Alan Wake 2. I mean, there were ridiculous amounts of references in Alan Wake 2 to the uh, the Bureau, right? Which is the name of the, this this group, this entity, these people in Control who are trying to solve these paranormal uh, things. Um, I guess we'll see what happens. But holy shit, what a lie he told about Best Buy. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Yes, I told a big lie. Sure I did. Anyway. Um, so, yes, uh, Control. I'm excited that they own it now. And I'm, I'm actually excited to hear what they're going to do with the franchise next. I want to hear more about this sequel. Okay? Cool. Um, oh, this is, here's a good one. You ready for this? The Last of Us director, Neil Druckmann, has said in an interview... He doesn't think that he has many more big games left in him. Oh, this is really too bad. Anyway, moving on, let's continue with real news. Um, okay. No, I'll actually comment on this for real. All right. Uh, basically in the interview, here's what he says. So, when they were making games like Uncharted 1 and 2, okay, and what's hilarious is in the interview... As they're interviewing this guy, the way he's talking is like he was the one doing it all, right? Like, oh, yeah, back with those games, it was a party atmosphere. Everything was laid back. 
We'd have late nights where, especially with like the multiplayer of Uncharted 2, we would just sit around the office playing this game to the wee hours of the morning, enjoying it, tweaking it a little bit, and all of this, right? And it's like, what's hilarious about that story is he wasn't the, like really fully in charge of any of those games he's describing that he claims were the better games. He would he would shared responsibility with many other people who no longer work for the company. He forced them out because his attitude basically was that he was going in a certain direction with these games and these people wanted to go in another and he basically was like well it's my way to the highway they said well then we're leaving we're not putting up with you you're like a giant ego you're an egomaniac we want nothing to do with you good luck and we're gonna go do our own stuff and so i believe there were two people who were also in charge of those games in charge of one and two that is who left after that and kind of left the the real story was uncharted 4 was a completely different game and then got retooled under Druckmann's watch to be what it ended up being, which, by the way, was a great game, but that basically the studio, then when those people left, completely turned direction, and that's why you've got The Last of Us 1. That's a completely somber, serious tone, talking about really interesting plot lines, like what's it like in a post-apocalyptic situation where people are dying left and right from these cordyceps? Uh, you know, what are the human relationships like in that situation? right take a look at the, re the relationship between joel and ellie in that game and all of that and it's all about survival and emotion and then last of us 2 just becomes a very generic piece of revenge angst teen very teen angsty fucking game where everyone's a dumbass people acting out of character from the first game basically you could tell someone else wrote last of us 2 versus last of us 1 yeah it was neil Druckmann. He wrote part two, and the plot of part two, in my opinion, was atrociously fucking bad. Not even close to how good Last of Us 1 was. Because he wrote the whole fucking thing, and the people who wrote the good parts of Last of Us 1 aren't worth the company anymore. They moved on, right? So, basically, he says in this interview, when we, when we were making the old games, it was like a party atmosphere. But basically, once we started making games that were expected to be giant blockbusters for Sony, it sucked all the fun out of it. And he even says, you know, recently when I've been working on other projects, like The Last of Us TV show, or uh, there was something else that he recently did too, and I can't even remember what it was. But basically, he's like, that stuff was so much more fun and, and interesting to me than making these games. So I think that basically, like, Last of Us 3 is probably the last one for him. To which I say, good. Please. As soon as you can. I, I wish you the best. Get the fuck out. Let people who have passion for games make them, who don't have agendas. Let people who are actually going to make meaningful games make meaningful games again. The games you have made since you took over the studio have been dog shit. No, really. They've been way worse than the games that came before. You ran The Last of Us into the ground. You made a TV series about a post-apocalypse that doesn't have zombies in it besides one episode. You know, like, you're terrible. You know, and there is there is a group of people who like what he does because of the way he goes about his stuff with his leftist agendas. So if you like that content, follow the guy as he moves on from games. But please just get the fuck out of games. Because I keep saying this, we don't need politics in our video games. The whole point of a video game is that we're supposed to be able to escape all of the drama of our real lives, right? And have a good time together, enjoying a fantasy. I don't need to play a fantasy and say, oh, well, now it's all about politics. This group and that group and this representation and this spin on this and this is misogynist and this is this and this is... Fuck you off, man. I hear it all day. All day, every day, everywhere you go on the internet, on social media, everywhere you go in politics, you hear this constantly. I don't need to boot up my video game and hear the same shit from you because you can't fucking grow the fuck up and keep your shit out of your games. In fact, Last of Us 2 sold as well as it did because of it. If Last of Us 2 did not have those themes, it wouldn't have been Game of the Year. Sorry, that's just true. I don't care what anyone else says. That's the truth of it. The game was great on its own merits, but it was really that whole agenda that he had. Remember, if you buy Last of Us 2, a vote for Last of Us 2 for the Game Awards, that sticks it to the haters. That really gets those bigots, so do it. I don't want that in games. I want games to sell and be popular, all right, because they're good, not because of a fucking feel-good movement from some political agenda that the guy can't sell his games otherwise, right? 
And if you don't believe me and you think I'm making it up, he publicly apologized for it. Take a look at the end of that year during the Game Awards when he was campaigning on social media for people to vote for the game to make it Game of the Year. And then he had to retract his statements and apologize for it because he realized how immoral it was when people called him out for it. So that's what I mean, like, I just, I hate this guy. I'm sorry. He doesn't belong in game development. He's ruining game development and turning it political. I don't need politics in my fucking video games. What's sad about it is, Last of Us 2 was pretty much the most accessible video game of all time, right? It did a lot of things good. <clears throat> you might say, well, that's great for games. You're correct. However, because he made his game so political, how many people actually talk about that? Right? After Last of Us 2 released, what was the next thing that Neil Druckmann did? Re-released Last of Us 1 for full price. What was the next thing that he did? Re-released Last of Us 2. What was the next thing that he did? Well, he made the television series. What was the next thing that he did? Well, I'm going to make a full-fledged multiplayer game out of factions. Then he canceled it. What has he actually done? Nothing. He's sitting on his, his pile of political laurels, acting like because... Last of Us 2 was, was made Game of the Year that he's like God's gift to gaming. He's not. In fact, it's hilarious because in the interview, he says, man, I really liked the directing a lot. Like, he's basically saying he wants to be a director. Hollywood does not want Neil Druckmann at all. All right? After he did his Last of Us season, and of course, the critics said it was great because guess what? The critics are all leftist liberals and they love this guy. Well, he tried to go and uh, the rounds. He went to all these events. What was it? I can't remember if it was like the Golden Globes or whatever. But he goes to this event and he's thinking, I'm going to be the talk of the town. People are going to see me as the guy who transitions video games from games into theater or, or television or movies. Like, I'll be the guy. I'll be the transitioner. No one talked to this fucking guy. They all were like, who is this fucking guy? They don't know who he is. He looks like he's full of, he's posing for the cameras. No one wants a picture. No one interviewed him. No one cared. No one cares about Neil Druckmann except Neil Druckmann and his cult. That's it. <laughs> I just find it hilarious, right? That this guy is so full of himself. You know, I just can't take game development. It's too hard now. It's not fun. I just want to direct. No one wants you to direct. In fact, I'll, I'll even say this. Do you know who everyone would love to direct something? Hideo Kojima. That's who people want to see make shows. That's who people want to see make movies. Because the guy's games basically are shows and movies. And they're some of the most unique things you've ever seen. I would love to watch a Hideo Kojima television show or movie. I don't want to see Neil Druckmann do anymore. He sucks. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> Alright, I'm done. I'm not going to rant anymore about this fucking jackass. He already wasted enough of my time. Alright, our final news story for today is... Sadly, is the worst. Okay? You ready? EA Games is laying off 670 employees. What the fuck? We just had a news story a couple days ago. Sony laid off like 5% of their workforce. And now EA Games is doing the same. Here's what they had to say about it. We are sunsetting games and moving away from development of future licensed IPs that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry. This greater focus will allow us to drive creativity, accelerate innovation, and double down on our biggest opportunities, including our own IP, sports, and massive online communities. EA canceled the unannounced Star Wars FPS game that was in development by Respawn Entertainment that was supposed to be the Mandalorian game. Yes, if you can believe it. Ready? Ready? EA laid off the entirety of the Battlefield Studio Ridgeline Games. This was the studio known for developing nar narrative experiences in Battlefield. The entire studio was laid off. Okay? And so, what they're saying in a nutshell, we don't want to take chances on anything good anymore. What we need to do is lean into the IPs that we know are money makers. So, more Madden more FIFA, more microtransactions and games as a service, less good original games. That's literally what they're saying with their public statement. 
Okay? Now, you might say, I don't understand. What is going on with gaming? Why is Sony laying off so many people? Why is EA laying off so many people? Why did Microsoft just lay off so many people? None of this seems to make any sense. Okay? Isn't the games industry profitable? I thought that we're hearing record sales numbers for video games. I thought that games were actually making profits. In general, you're right. Not every game. And I think that is one of the major changes here is that unlike previously where it seemed like if you worked for a AAA studio, no matter what game you made was going to sell, right? That's not the case anymore. Just look at what just happened with Suicide Squad, right? So things are changing and more indie studios are getting all kinds of attention now. And their games, for example, like I just said, Pal World, Helldivers 2, these are games that now are, are selling so well. That's a good thing. You want to have that competition, and you want the AAA guys on their toes, not thinking that everything they do will always be a slam dunk, okay? However, <clears throat> basically, here's what people are saying, because there's all these different analyses on this, okay? And everyone seems to be having different takes on it, all right? For example, let me just give you some perspective here. This is actually from Zubitech, a very poignant tweet, I feel, Okay? The Last of Us Part 2 cost over $220 million to make. Horizon Forbidden West cost over $212 million to make. God of War Ragnarok cost over $200 million to make. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 <clears throat> excuse me, cost over $300 million to to make okay so each game is costing more and more and more and more to develop revenues are increasing meaning these games are selling for example marvel spider-man sold enough to turn a profit within like a week right however what is the actual return on investment right overall how much money are they really making in the long run Right? It's a good question. It might, it very well could be that back in the day, you know, we're talking the era of the PS2, right? The, the biggest console of all time. At least it was at one point. Who knows if a fucking shitty Nintendo console, I'll sold it by now. But you see the point I'm making. Back then, development costs for these games were nowhere near this. But then they would sell a ton. And the, these companies would make insane profits on them. Now, if you have an insane budget, right? And this game takes so long to, to make, and it comes out, even if it sells well, it still might not make that return on investment as the old days. And so now you've got to rely on having a library of games coming out. But how do you do that? More employees, more studios, more overhead cost. So the industry is pushing for these giant experiences. Every video game needs to be 40 to 80 hours long. Every video game needs an open world with all of this content. It needs to have... all. It's like a checklist of expectations. Whenever the era of PS4 and Xbox One, every game could now be open world because these consoles could handle it. But the question really was, or it is now, what's profitable for these companies and do the, does this game experience now warrant the amount of money that they're putting into it, right? Take a look at a game like Horizon Forbidden West, okay? Imagine if Horizon Forbidden West only cost $100 million to make. And instead of having 60 plus hours of content, it only had 20. But those 20 hours were streamlined, super fun, very well done. And it didn't have all of that extra open world bloated content that most people don't even do. Would it have been a bad game? Would it have sold better or worse? It probably, I'll be honest with you, I think it would have sold the same. I think it would have actually sold just as much as the game did now. And they would have had a bigger return on investment. I'm just saying. Maybe what's happening is that these games are too overbloated. You're spending so much money to develop them, and you're hiring so many people, and you got so much work being done, that by the time the game comes out, it's great that it has all these features, but how many people are realistically really enjoying all of them, and how many people are going to spend a ton of money on that experience? Most people will buy the game once they're done with it. They're not doing any microtransactions. You know what I'm saying? So a game like Madden, minimal effort, and then makes insane money every year. A game like God of War Ragnarok, it's a one-time buy. You're not going to spend any more money on that one, so you have to rely on it selling a ton. But it has all that 
budget of $200 million, will it turn a profit, right? This is a pretty uh, an interesting thing you have to think about when you think about game development in the modern day. Now, there's all these different takes on it, okay? So, <laughs> here's the thing. You would think from all of these game studios laying people off. I mean, we just had, what, 900-some employees at Sony, over 1,000-plus employees at Microsoft, now 600-some employees at EA. You, and by the way, just think about that. That's 2,000-plus people in the games industry who have to find another job at another game company. Where else are they going to work, right? But is the, if the games industry is downscaling right now, where are they going to work? Because imagine if you worked at Microsoft. That's okay. I could get a job at Sony. Oops, Sony just laid off people. That's all right. I'll go work at EA. Oops, EA just laid off people. Where are you going to work, right? It's pretty challenging right now for someone in that industry. Um, but here's, here's something that a lot of people got to realize. These companies are making profit. These companies are not destitute. These companies are not without you know a, a money at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. If you actually take a look at numbers, supposedly most of these companies are doing quite well. So then why are they downscaling? Because this is how American business works. It's scary to think, but this is how it works. Now, I, I, I say American, Sony did it too, and Sony's a Japanese company. But the point I'm making here is that they really feel like if they need to be more profitable... It's better to actually sacrifice employees' livelihoods, all right, to save money or make more money. It actually results as profit, more profit on a spreadsheet when they lay these people off. If you can believe it, that's how it works. They think that's a better option than actually having to make better products. I, I, I really wish that that wasn't how it is, but this is how it happens all the time, okay, where basically... Again, as I've already said, you're a number on a spreadsheet. You're a cog in a machine. And if it comes to the bottom line, like we got to make profit, profit, profit. We got to make maximum profits for our shareholders. So that way the, pri the price of the stock goes up, the company's valuation goes up, and then we make more money. And then we make more money. And then we make more money. That's what these companies are really in effect doing. Okay? They don't care what games they're making anymore. The people who are running these companies have become corporate bigwigs. That's, these people on the boards of directors of these companies are not game makers. They don't play the fucking games. They don't care about what games they're making. They care about the money on the spreadsheet and how much money is in their pockets and how much money goes to the shareholders and how much more money can be made. And to some extent, I get that. Yes, it's a corporation. It has to basically make money. But at the same time, you are artistic. You have a company that makes art. Not a product. Art. Any company that makes movies, television, music, theater, it's art. It's all optional entertainment. And it is, video games are the most profitable industry on the planet right now. They make more money than everything combined. At one point do we realize sometimes it's not just about the money. But these people don't want to hear that. All they care about is the money. So when you hear that the games industry is laying off all these people, oh, they must be crashing, right? They're not. The, they're, they're making more money than ever. They really are. It's just that they don't care about the employees. It used to be these studios cherished their employees because they knew that they needed those people to pump out the next game. Now, they're all disposable. Hell, there's 2,000 people right now floating in limbo with no jobs who anyone thinks they could just scoop up whenever they need them to make the next hot game and then fucking fire them again when they're done. That's how they're seeing it. That's not how to operate an industry. That's predatory, right? That's literally predatory to an industry. And this is just going to destroy the way that we see games be made. It's really going to screw stuff up for, for us. Um, I'm really seeing, sadly, this isn't a game crash because there's no crash. The demand is higher than ever and so are the profits. But I could see the entire way games are made changing in the future, right? Where you don't even have set dev teams anymore. You just have head-hunted contractors come in, make a game, and then they dip. Because they can't rely on these companies to give them a career anymore. Because the people at top are greedy. <clears throat> I just... It's so obvious what's going on. But it's like, what do you do when you've created the entire business and industry to work like that? Because again, it's not just the games industry. It's all, so many different corporations are like this where they just don't care. There's no morality to their decisions. A corporation feels like it doesn't have to have morality because it's not a person. It's a business. Bullshit, 
businesses are run by people. At some point, there has to be some kind of a morality code, a code of conduct. We say we're not just going to dispose of people in the fucking street when we don't need them anymore because we wanted to increase our valuation on a spreadsheet because we wanted to make more money. That's ridiculous, right? I don't know, man. I, To me, it sure sounds pretty evil, <clears throat> right? And here's the other problem with this, okay? When this is happening to the entire industry, this is not one company, this is not two companies, this is basically the whole industry this is happening to, correct? So when this is happening to the entirety of the industry at once, here's what happens. People who normally would have said, oh, I want to get into that industry and I'm a creative person and I, I feel like I could really make great games says, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I mean, I got a family. I got to provide for them. There's no stability in game development. <clears throat> at any moment, these companies could just dump me and now I have no job and I can't do that. I got to find something more stable for me and my family. So... They don't go into game development. They do something else with their lives, right? So what ends up happening is the most talented people don't want to get into the industry anymore. And now game quality dips. And now games just become a commodity. Something you buy for a, a meaningless few hours of pleasure. And then the only way you can get more pleasure out of it is to dump more money into it with a microtransaction, right? And we lose that era of the big game blockbuster that's a meaningful game that's, you know, resonates with you forever. Instead, it's just, ah, it's just a, a fuck around experience. Here, I'm going to play for a few hours to kill some time. Done. What did you play today? I don't even know. I don't know what I played. I just fucked around. I killed some time, right? That's what will happen. The entire industry will just be fucking around. Instead of actually caring about big game experiences to have meaning. You won't have the big blockbusters with epic stories, groundbreaking gameplay and graphics. You'll just have the same game 7,000 times with a new skin slapped over it with more microtransactions attached to it. That's the future of the games industry if we let this happen and if we let these companies do whatever they want. You know, for ever, every single one of these fucking big CEOs of these game companies that act like they're some kind of a rock star celebrity when in reality they're just a money grubber, right? We just let this happen. So, and you might say, well, how do we fix this? <clears throat> with your wallets. Don't buy games from these companies who are doing this to their employees. Stop fucking buying EA microtransaction sports games. Just stop. Don't buy Madden. Don't buy FIFA. Don't spend money on fucking Ultimate Team. If you stop supporting the bad practices that allow them to act like this, they will stop the actions. But if you reward the bad actions, they will continue with them. Right? The best way for Pokemon to improve is to stop buying every shitty Pokemon game on the Switch that runs like dirt. Just fucking stop buying them, right? Don't reward the bad behavior, and then they won't continue it. But our industry is so weird, we reward the bad behaviors. We buy the things that we say we don't want. We support the things that we say are harmful. The most profitable games ever are microtransaction-laden games like GTA Online and Fortnite. Yet, we say that's not the experiences we want. We want these epic games with big stories and a, tons of meaningful content. But then we buy, we spend all our money on the junk. So what do you think they're going to keep making? Junk. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to dump more employees because they see them as disposable. This is what will happen. Right? So, yeah, that's all I have to say. is uh, it's It's a symptom of an industry where directly the consumers are financing the bad behaviors and allowing these companies, enabling them to do these awful things to their employees. We need to change that. We need to stop spending money on crap. Just stop entirely. No more excuses. Oh, but I, but every time I boot up GTA Online, it's such an awesome social experience. Fucking turn the game off and go out with your friends and spend money at a real business. All right? Go to the bar. Go to the restaurant. Go hang out. Go play sports. Go fucking whatever. Turn off the fucking microtransaction game where every moment you're paying them more money. Stop rewarding them for bad behaviors. Turn off the FIFA bullshit, the fucking Madden nonsense, and go support real people. Spend real life time with your friends. Stop fucking around online because this is why this is happening to the industry. All right? Literally, the moment you spend money on junk, you're rewarding a CEO sitting in a boardroom who just cut 600 jobs because they said, we're going to focus and lean into our big IPs with microtransactions in them. 
You did it. Stop. Or else this will just get worse. I don't know what else to say. You have to stop the fucking madness and stop the bad behavior. Okay. That's what I have to say about that. And if you disagree, you're wrong. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's get the shout outs. Because now we're running late on the show. Uh, so a troll did a couple super chats and I banned him because he's uh, an idiot. So that was great. Uh, SD Chargers with a super chat. He says, Habit in my area has the best onion rings around. Yeah, like I said, my onion rings were pretty much inedible. I, I literally took my onion ring and it was on my table and I went like this and it didn't break. It was so hard that it was like actually rocks. They like triple fucking fried the thing. I don't know. Again, I, I get the feeling... The people making the burgers were good. Like, they, they're pros. They know what they're doing because they make more burgers than anything else. But they probably had a bunch of kids working the rest of the kitchen not knowing what the hell they were doing. And uh, they ruined it. So there you go. <clears throat> okay. So that's all we've got so far on the YouTube side. Again, guys, please today, if ever you were going to support the streams, today would be a great day to do it. The last day of, of February, and this would definitely, any support I get today will help make up for the issue with the memberships that we've been having for a month and a half. And I would really appreciate support if you can. So thank you. Um, if I could get this to work. This thing's freezing up on me. Hold on. Okay, now it's working. Uh, let's get the tips. <clears throat> okay. We start off with a $2 tip. I think you you are... I think you're all right, Phil. You have a thicker skin and bigger balls than most keyboard warriors on the internet. I wish I could tip more, but... I just can't afford that much. You bring a smile to my face, and I look forward to your videos. Keep being you. Much love from Australia. So it sounds like an anonymous $2 tip to start today. Thank you so very much. I appreciate that. And I've always said this, and I'll just reiterate. Never, ever feel bad or apologize. If you're contributing to my content, supporting it, and saying, oh, I'm sorry it wasn't more. That's absolutely ridiculous. The reason that I'm here... And still able to make a living doing this after 16 years of doing it is because of a person just saying, hey, here's a little bit of support I can give you, and it adds up. That's why. It's not just about one person coming by and going crazy with support. It's about everyone working together. It's a community feeling. That's really the reason why <clears throat> I'm still here. So thank you so much for that. I received another $2 tip. Another anonymous one. Just two in a row. Two anonymous $2 tips. Okay. <clears throat> I wonder if that was the same person. I don't know. It might have been the same person twice. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> From Rocky, he tipped me a dollar. He says, this wig looks like the haircut from the Advent Children movie. I don't know. But it's supposed to be a cloud strife wig. It really doesn't look like one at all. But there it is. And again, if we hit the goal today, I'll put on that stupid wig. I don't know if I'll keep it on because I have no idea if it would even be comfortable. Uh, but I will definitely wear the wig for a bit. So thank you for that Rocky dollar tip here. <clears throat> and then I received another tip. Do you guys want to see the wig again? Because many of you weren't here for the beginning of the podcast because you, you forgot that it was early, right? You ready? This is the fan-donated wig that I got for today for the premiere of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Ladies and gentlemen, I, pre I present to you the incredibly accurate Cloud Strife wig. Doesn't that look exactly like Cloud's hairdo? Right? Like, to a T. I don't, I, I've never seen a hairdo better than that. It's the most accurate representation of Cloud I think that's possible. Right? It looks like, I said, it looks like someone scalped Rod Stewart. <laughs> right? Very accurate. I don't think... Hand sculpted to be exactly like Cloud's hairdo. Absolutely. <laughs> right. <clears throat> anyway... I received a dollar tip from Epic Kirk Rebrushed. As a person with an obsessive cult following, I must defend Neil Druckmann. He wrote the Uncharted game series, which makes Indiana Jones look like a Bob Ross marathon. No, he did not. 
He did not write that series by himself. He wrote the Uncharted game series along with what's her name, Amy Hennig, and someone else too. It was a, it was three or four people together who actually wrote Uncharted. Then he basically kicked them out of the company, and he now takes the full credit for it as if he did all the work when he didn't. Like I said in in this interview, where Druckmann says, "Oh, I'm tired, and I, I don't have many more big games in me." Man, those old games that when I made them, it was a party atmosphere. It's like, dude, you didn't make them. It wasn't you. It was you and like three other people and they don't work for your company anymore because they hate you. <laughs> but he, he reinvents history with it in his interviews. It's like, what are you talking about? Anyway. Um, okay. Continuing on. Whoops. Continuing on. I just hit my mouse. Um, I received a $5 tip. <laughs> Listen to this. It's an anonymous $5 tip. Someone dumped a mattress in my alley with, along with a bunch of trash. I can't wait to go outside and hit it with a baseball bat. It'll disappear just like in Like a Dragon. <laughs> of course. Everyone knows that's the proper way of waste disposal. Just beat things with bats. They'll go right away. Very nice. Thank you very much. Another uh, Every tipper this morning besides Kirk was anonymous. So far, the $5 tip's the biggest one, so I'll put that up on the leaderboard. Okay. Continuing on. I received a $2 tip from Lady Charisma. Support more indie devs. Send a message about what you want for gaming. Look at the devs that get popular online these days. Normally smaller games that are genuinely fun but are made by a small team or perhaps even one person. You know, I got to agree with you, although I hate to say it, it really is hard for me to get attention for indies on my streams. For whatever reason, I seem to have a, a viewer base that loves these big AAA mainstream advertised games and whenever I try to like check out an indie or check out something that's not heavily promoted or advertised it's, it's like pulling tea it really is but I agree with you that these indie games seem to be doing a lot better in some cases I mean notably some of the games that I played in most recently like Hades that game's superb it's a great story right amazing addictive gameplay massive replayability Superb, superb game. I wish that I could play more indies, but again, sadly, people don't really check out the games that I play when I play indie games. Stray, Stray? That game was sick. That game looked great, played great. I want a sequel, is so good. You know what I'm saying? Like, indie games definitely these days are, are, are more prominent, in my opinion, when it comes to like innovation, when it comes to giving the players what they're looking for in a creative experience, as opposed to this bloated. $200 million open world with 60 hours of content out of which 30, 40 hours is meaningless. Right? For sure. What was the other one? So yeah, Sea of Stars. I love Sea of Stars. I can't wait to get back to it later this year. It's another one. You know, it resonates with what people are looking for. Right? Shout out to Pizza Box Gaming. Who just did a $5 super chat says, I have a different take. I think we as gamers benefit from these massive rounds of layoffs. The actual talented, passionate devs will make their own games. Well, here's the problem with that. I understand what you're saying. You're like, oh, that's fine. So now the, the devs will go off and do their own thing. Yeah, but you have to understand something. The standard line level devs that are getting laid off here are not rich. These are the people who do the grunt work. You know, for every shitty stupid open world grind mission in one of these games someone has to code that those are the people who just lost their jobs you know and it's not their fault they just did what they were told so now they're not needed anymore and now they don't have money to go make their own studio you know you're talking if like a big wig who is in charge of an entire game project and that project sold tons so they had like a ton of money right out of the sales of that game then they can go off and make their own studio but that's not the case for most of these devs it's just not. They don't have all the money. Again, these are normal people like you and me. They have lives. They have jobs. They don't have insane amounts of money saved up to go open a studio. It'd be great if they did, but I don't foresee that. They're, these are working class people. Fallen Angels. Thank you for becoming a member this morning. It says in chat, I work for a gaming company and I'm grunt level, so now I, this is very scary for me. I completely understand. I get it. You must be crapping bricks because the whole industry right now is downscaling. And it's not your fault. You just, you work your ass off, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> I 
I've heard about this game Lethal Company, Lady Charisma. I don't know too much about it, though. But I did hear about it, and people are saying that it's good. But I it's just, as you know, I have been so, so inundated with all the games that I'm playing, right? I'm so backlogged on the games that I'm playing currently that I just don't have flexibility to be checking out a bunch of games like that. I would maybe like to eventually get to those games. Um, but I'll be honest, you know, the whole Baldur's Gate 3 thing has really kept me you know, locked with, with gameplay for the last two and a half months. I think when Baldur's Gate 3 finishes, we're going to feel like a big sigh of relief and be like, ah, freedom to do more things now, right? <laughs> Seriously. I see now a lot of people are showing up to stream and I welcome you all. We're going to be starting Final Fantasy VII Rebirth in a few. We're, we're actually ending the podcast now and I'm going to take a brief break to use the restroom. We're going to be by noonish here. We will have the game rolling for you guys for around three hours of this premiere gameplay, okay? I just received a $25 tip from One Minute Man. Well, basically, One Minute Man just said 5,000 things about Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> I, I mean, I so much information. He said, like, 10 statements about my last stream. It's all good information, by the way. But I don't think it's pertinent to today talking about Final Fantasy, nor is this stuff that I'm going to remember by, uh, shit, Wednesday when we play it again. What sucks is he's basically saying there was a, there was a, um, a puzzle... I guess. We were doing this mission. We were fighting these grease creatures. And we were looking for a skull. And he's basically saying the skull was right there. And somehow I missed it. I don't even know how I missed it. I don't even know what he's talking about. It sucks. Like, I wanted to solve that quest. And I didn't. So I wonder what happens now. I wonder if you can go back and do it. Anyway, thank you one minute, man. I mean, that's a million things about Boulder's Gate. And I appreciate that. And I read it. And I understand it. And hopefully I can, we can think about that stuff again when I play on uh, on Wednesday. Okay. All right. So, do we have any last minute? Any anyone have any last minute things to say, or shall we adjourn the show and then get ready for Final Fantasy VII? What do you guys think? Last question, last second. If you want to tag me in the chat? Expand Dog says we should agree, stop rewarding bad business practices, but you need to do your part too. You bought the deluxe edition of Hogwarts. I see. I don't even remember. Did I? I think I wanted to play it early. MK1 and Like a Dragon, which paywall New Game Plus, just my two cents. Hogwarts, I got it particularly to play it early because people wanted me to. They actually wanted me to play it as early as possible. That's the only reason I did that. Mortal Kombat, I mean, that was really dumb because you could play it early, but the game sucked, so that really was a mistake, and I don't think I should have done that. Like a Dragon, the reason I bought the Deluxe Edition is because I wanted as much content as possible so that I could play it with my wife for the Dondoko Island. And some of that has paid off, and some of it hasn't. I think it's really going to pay off the most when we do the Sujimon League stuff, because I have so many items, I'll be able to level up Sujimon immediately with no problem. Um, no, but I I have to actually agree with Expandong. It seems like most of the times when I've bought these... Boy, I just say Expandong, it rolls right off the tongue like a normal name now. Like, I just don't even... I'm not even phased by his name anymore, which is pretty interesting. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I think Expandong actually has a point where when you're buying these deluxe editions of games, unless there's definitively something in there that you know for sure you are going to make some kind of benefit from or profit on, then you probably shouldn't waste time on it, right? And I do think that with Like a Dragon, I mean, I did get the additional jobs, which have been fun, you know, the linebacker and the tennis player. But outside of that, I really haven't used anything from the extra money I spent. So, you know... I guess it is. I guess he's right. I guess he has a point, right? I'm not above looking at myself in the mirror with this stuff as well. So maybe I should just buy standard editions of games. Okay. All right, guys, we got to get out of here because we got to start with the game. Like I said, so thank you all. A great podcast today. I hope that you all enjoyed it. I thank you for chilling with me. It's time to end the show. I forgot to. I forgot to take out the winter. I want to put in a new piece of artwork here. And I forgot to take out the winter artwork. I mean, technically, today's still February. I'll see if I can remember to do that for tomorrow. Anyway, thank you all. 
Great podcast. Excited to jump into Final Fantasy VII all day today and then give you my opinions on it. So I, I thank you all for hanging out with me. And let's jump into three plus hours and then another two plus hours tonight. And I can't wait to give you that day one impressions, man. All right. Thank you, guys. See you tomorrow for all of that.